welcome to the Starlight Ballroom. Hey! Hello and welcome to Shipwrecked and Comatose, the podcast about Red Dwarf. Now, this isn't a planned episode. It's basically just a little bit of a chat. My name is Mark Adams. I am one of your regular hosts. And with me at this time is Kurt North, who is also one of our regular hosts. Hello, Kurt. Hello. How are you? I'm good. It seems like you've been having a fun weekend. And that's why we're having this little chat. Last time we did this was when there was a big announcement about Red Dwarf. And, well, you've had a nice chat. And I thought I'd have a chat with you about that chat. I, I live in the, the depths of uh, Carlisle, which is the northwest of England. And... You know, we don't often get very many pleasant surprises and pleasant um, pleasant uh, experiences. Chris Barry decided to turn up this weekend, just gone to a con, con, which was really nice. I mean, obviously, a lot of people get the opportunity to meet Red Dwarf actors and people like that at Comic Cons. Why have we decided that we'd have this chat? Because, you know, people always say hello and have a handshake and a photo and... Uh, a signature, but you got a little bit more, didn't you? Got a little bit more, yeah. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it in uh, in general, but yeah, there's there was interesting comments that he was making, and we have to be really careful about how we say this. And I would say he- speculation and general consensus that there may be information about an upcoming Red Dwarf project. Gosh. Okay, so first up, you just went and said hello to Chris Barry at your, just as a, as everyone does with a, you know, a handshake and a photo. I'm yep. not being like sarcastic about this, but you know what I mean? There's a lot of times at conventions where there's a big queue and you don't get to spend much time with the person. But um, you got a little bit more time, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't want to paint this as a, as a bad thing for, for Carla Comic Con because I want to get more guests to come to my neck of the woods because that that is... Just it just happened to Hattie Heydrich actually came to the con in 2019, and that was before we started this Red Dwarf podcast. So, um, and I wasn't aware of the con to be fair, and, and it's not a, something that I would normally go to anyway. I mean, I've done a couple of X Files ones over in America. I'm not a huge Comic Con goer. It's not something I'd really be that interested in doing. Um, they're all great when you go to them, but it's just not necessarily my thing. But when I saw Chris Barry was on there, I'm on a Red Dwarf podcast, Mark. I don't know if you know, but I'm on a Red Dwarf I podcast. I thought that, yeah. Mm. So I thought, he's in literally within five-minute drive of my house, and I might as well. So I walked in. His his queue was long. Uh, he was he was the biggest star in the in there. There was Sophie Eldred from Doctor Who, who played uh, Ace, wasn't it, as the companion. Yeah, yeah. So she was there. So, so, yeah, so those were the two kind of main stars in there. There was, like, sort of character actors from you know, costume design, um, like sort of from Star Wars and a, couple, a person from uh, Harry Potter and, and the like. So there was, there was like sort of, you know, like low-level actors there that, that were good, but obviously Chris Barry was the main draw. When I went in, I went in just after lunchtime, um, which was perfect timing because the queue was quite small. But from then on, when he did his Q&A and before his photo shoot, he was chock-a-block. You couldn't get anywhere near him. So I just timed it perfectly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that's that's, what, that's basically what happened. So I went in there with my partner, spoke to him just about our podcast and what we've done and how this podcast formed. Just had a very just general conversation. We did talk about briefly about uh, Simon the Sorcerer. He he's just recorded um, the prequel uh, voiceover. He did two days. That's so cool. Something for Matt to cover, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he, he recorded that in two days over a two day period, and he talked about. The new Red Dwarf podcast, uh, not the new Red Dwarf podcast, the new Red Dwarf um, situation. I'll talk about that more when because he talks about it a little bit more in the actual Q and A. But he talked a yeah. little bit about that, and then we just talked about you know our Red Dwarf fandom and and stuff like that. So so that first initial meeting was great. What I will say was, uh, which is I always find amazing when these things happen, and it became it probably made me a little bit more memorable. Is that I went. Um, so, because I'm really looking forward to this, I'm, I'm no doubt that I might stand up and ask you a question at the Q and A session. Um, and he went, Q and A session. What Q and A session? I went, You've got a Q and A session half one. And he went, Have I? 
Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's on the on the on the schedule. And he goes, "All oh, right, I was going to have my lunch at half one. I better go now." So, so he got up <laughs> and he got up and went. So that was amazing. And that was that was the, that was the, the first meeting. So a lot of it was more to do with like obviously shipwreck and comatose, a little bit on Simon the Sorcerer, and a little bit on um, you know because I, I talked about the things like we've covered Tomb Raider, we've covered Simon the Sorcerer, blah blah blah. And he just happened to mention, "Oh, I recorded back in February." About that. That's yeah. so cool. It's, 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 I'm, I'm guessing that that's known that there's a Simon the Sorcerer, se- Sorcerer sequel, right? I don't know. We'd have to refer to Matt on that, but it's a prequel, apparently. A sequel, prequel. The, the fun that <laughs> one. You know what I'm getting at. I hope we haven't like accidentally revealed something we're not supposed to. You might, nah. <laughs> nah. nah. Uh, there's got to sure be. Haven't. I'm sure we haven't. <laughs> but I love that, that he wouldn't have had lunch if it hadn't been for you. Exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll look after my stars. Yeah, you do, clearly. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the Q&A. Did you get any tidbits that um, are interesting to share with the listeners? Well, let's go for the big one, because this was happen- This was about 10 minutes into the conversation. And, and again, I want to make sure, because obviously we're not an official source. We are, I'm just reporting back what he said, and... We're not 100% sure. We cannot collaborate with Doug or anyone else about what he actually said. So we're coming from... Yes, but you weren't the only person sat there. You're not doing anything naughty. There were hundreds of people that heard him say what he said. So you're not like breaking any rules. I'm not breaking any rules. Simon the Sorcerer thing, but you're not with this. (laughs) Um, But I want to make sure that we're not saying something that people might jump the gun and go, oh my God, that's happened. I can't believe it. Where's the news for it? You know, and then instantly go to reddwarf.com and see nothing. Oh, mate. I was at a Doctor Who convention once and they um, they announced that there was a new series coming and that there was going to have Hugh Grant as the Doctor and it was just utter, utter bullshit. So take this with a pinch of salt. Conventions can be full of shit. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. His but, but word. Tell us the goth, Kurt. Chris, tell Chris, us the goth. I'm trying my best to hold off, Anna. Uh, so, um... <laughs> Chris Barry said, and he said to a number of people at the table and then in this Q&A that a Red Dwarf with Doug has been greenlit and it will be another hour and a half special. And he so said, a film with the original cast, not with the, the original prequel cast. With, no. Right. So I'll get to the split off in a minute. But the, uh, so he basically said that this, they've had it greenlit for a new Red Dwarf special with Doug writing the original cast. It's going to be an hour and a half special potentially in 2024. I take that with a pinch of salt because green lit in my eyes is they've got a decent script. They've got an idea of what they want to do and then they've got to try and produce the thing. So it's in pre-production development. Yeah. My initial thought was, and I was speaking to an actor, not at the con, there's somebody I actually know and they were talking about various different things and um, we were talking about studios at the moment. And I think, um, I won't go into too much detail because there's some privacy in it, but there was a particular studio that's got numerous different projects that are currently on hold because of the SAG strike that haven't restarted yet. So because of that, that means that obviously windows for opportunities to to um, to bring other new stuff in either might be available at a short notice or might be put into the long grass. So by having like a p- potential production for 2024 would be great, but there's so much volatile stuff in the ether at the moment with, you know, where people are going to do. I mean, we're talking Hollywood movies and stuff like that. You know, we're talking like massive movies. I don't know, argument, say Deadpool or something. You know, they're still filming, blah, blah, blah. So it's yeah, trying, yeah, yeah. trying to find that studio time, I think. So I think 2024, for me personally, my initial thought was I can't see them getting anything out by the end of 2024. I would, my guess would be Easter next year. I don't know what you would think, but that would be my... Yes, I I would think they're maybe well into filming by October, maybe September, October time, potentially. So the term greenlit. Yeah. A green light doesn't mean you've put your foot on the accelerator, if we're going to use this as a strong metaphor. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic thing. And we've seen a Red Dwarf film already with the promise that, well, you've seen, (laughs) I haven't seen a Red Dwarf movie yet. Um, It's exciting news that there's clearly got they've got a fair, a fair distance but i don't think 
to see it for a year either, at least. And mm. it does put scuppers to our plans that we literally just announced on Twitter as well. <laughs> we were going to do that. the Promised Land of the Minute <laughs> podcast, but we, we might, might have no to more. fuck that off. It's one of those things, isn't it, where we we might actually get that recorded in time before anything new comes up, but you know, we'll have to we'll cross we that bridge if it comes to it. Oh, come on. The number of specials and dumb shittery we do in between series. No, the number of, of specials and dumb shittery you do, not me. But fair. <laughs> but we'll, we'll be lucky to get series 11 by the end of this year, let alone series 12 and the fucking promised land minutes. Come on. Yeah. Oh, and uh, behind the scenes, you're watching Red Dwarf 11 next week? We are. We're all getting together for like a little watch online. We have thought about doing some kind of like fans watch type sitch. But that involves way more technology than I'm prepared to get even vaguely involved with. <laughs> that will fall to me then. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that, do that. What do you think? Should we do that? Listeners? Think, do, you know what, do, I, that? do you know what? Do you know I was actually thinking um, just this morning about that. Whatever this event is, whatever they do with the, um, the 2024, 2025, late 25 or whatever, that we need to do like an after show straight after or something along those lines where we can do. That like, could be fun. Yeah. That might be something we could. We're not. We're not announcing that because we we don't know when it's going to be, where we are going to be in in this amount of time. But that's something we might need to consider. But mm. it's certainly something we could potentially do. Yeah, um, we might pull. It's pull also something that I think it's it. fun to keep our eye out for an official announcement because everything at a convention take with a pinch of salt. Yeah, the fact we, that he says do- greenlit. I mean, greenlit means to in my head that they've got to the stage where whoever's involved with this studio has gone. Or the, or the, you know, the the investors and wherever have gone, we're happy with this. Start doing your plans. Start planning. So yeah. at least, it, at least we know it's gone beyond that stage, and they must have some form of script. That's the yeah. way I'm reading it. Yeah, that strikes me that even at a convention, you wouldn't say something like that if you didn't genuinely believe it was something that might happen. Yeah, we never got Hugh Grant as a doctor, but hopefully we'll get this. No. It was what um, Chris Barry is a doctor. He would have made a great doctor. Yeah, yeah, he would. Yeah. Huh. Um. So yeah. So if I if I go through, I've got notes. I've got substantial notes. Um. About what happened on the Q and A. So I'll quickly go, go through, through them. Uh, so first up, he he arrived after his lunch with his with his backpack on, and he, he had lunch down, because of you. He had lunch because of me. Walked down the aisle, and the host wasn't there at the time. So it was quite interesting at the very beginning because he was like, oh, "Where's Paul? Where's Paul?" And uh, he started looking under like the desks. It was very much in, it's in a uh, like a central academy, so that was central school or such. Mm. And um, he was looking under desks for him. He was like, "Where is he?" Really? Uh, and then he started to just to go off on on one. He just kind of like said, "Well, you know, it's nice to be in Carlisle. I've never actually been in Carlisle before that I can remember, apart from coming through on the train." And he says, "I think I might have in the early days, but I just can't quite quite remember." He saw the piece of paper on the desk and it was questions for Sophie for the next Q&A. So he started to read that out to us. He started to go, so Sophie, you've got 32, uh, you've had 32 episodes of Doctor Who. He said, I don't think this is for me, is it? So that was great. (laughs) A bit of frivolity there was great. And he just started to like, just sit down on the table, like just on his back on the table and start talking to us. And that was, that was quite a nice little bit of, um, Thing. At that point, there was maybe about 80 to 100 people in the room, and it ended up being about 150 people, I'd say. It's probably in that room. That's pretty good. So, yeah. Um, and then the host arrived. He came in brazenly. He was like, I'm here. And then nobody said anything. And he was like, is no one going to applaud? And it was like, all right, we'll applaud him. And then Chris Barry then, <laughs> and then decided he was going to interview him. So we had, we had him being interviewed. He was um, saying about... The fact of what did he do before he was a Comic Con guy? He was a warehouse manager. He ran one of the um, longest running Star Wars events in the UK and made 65 grand for charity. So that was all great. And Chris Barry went, that deserves a round of applause, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, um, that, is, that does deserve a round of applause. It, yeah. Uh, then he kind of went into what you would normally expect. Like, uh, like I say, it's like many people who have been to Comic Con will have heard this. I'm sure Chris Barry spiels off the same sort of thing all the time, you know, when it talks about getting the chemistry right, that, you know, you've been 70 episodes, what do you think of the show, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of that going on. Um, it talks about the fact that, obviously, Red Dwarf, because it's based in the future, that doesn't have the same problems as, like, say, a 2.4 children would have, where it looks dated, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. 
Then they get into the split. So they talk about the Doug and the, the Rob thing. And all it was particularly on that question was a lot of what we just talked about, about the green lighting uh, to do the something. And his words were uh, green light for one of Doug's ideas to do a special maybe sometime in 2024. That's, that, that was the exact word. Was aware of the Rob potential. He did intimate that some very, very loose conversations have gone on with Rob Grant. Like sort of, you know, would you be into it? If you if we had you for a, a cameo or something like that, would you be into it? That kind of that's not what you said, but that it was kind of that feeling to it. You know, it's like it's going to mm. be a prequel. It's not going to be the main cast. I think Rob's even said that, hasn't he? He said, "Well, I might have the original cast in if it's possible." So they've mm. had a conversation, and but there's nothing in in like writing or anything that's like way 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 way. You like sort of like me saying to you, "I might come to see you in Manchester at one point." It's that kind of conversation. You have said that? I have said that, yeah. So, yeah, so there was that. Then they went to the floor. They talked about getting how he got British's voice. Again, Comic-Con, a lot of things. He does. He did a lot of the impressions when he was actually on the um, on the area, just talking about how he got the voice and the fact that he kind of put an Essex slant on it, that kind of thing. Talked about how British was different in relation to Red Dwarf in the fact that British takes were normally within three takes and it would take quarter of the time of Red Dwarf one, which I thought really? was intriguing. Yeah, Do you basically... feel like it was more Red Dwarf, more Britas, or more something else that the fans were there to talk to uh, someone like Chris Barry about? It was a bit of a mix. It was a bit of a mix. There was uh, some British questions, Red Dwarf questions, Me Machine as well. That was, that was brought up about he did Me Machines and what does he think his favourite Me Machines is and he said he was a locomotive. I think he thinks rail is probably the best kind of big machine that, that he thinks over overall. So I think it was a bit of a, quite an eclectic mix, really. So I thought that was quite nice actually to have that eclectic mix. Mm. Um, yeah, so that was good. Um, well, when he said about the quart, the, the British took like the director in, in British was very much like get three takes and done, whereas Red Dwarf, because of the four of them, he said that basically. Craig Charles is amazing. He just gets his line straight off the bat and does it. Chris Barry said about himself, he said, I generally get the gist of it. It takes me a couple of takes and I'm done. And then Rob and Danny are just horrendous. <laughs> they just like take forever. Uh, so that was nice. That was good to hear. Threw him under the bus. I love yeah, it. But exactly. I know he'd do that in, to them in person as well, wouldn't he? Yeah. He also said as well, they are talking about the favourite episodes, which I've got notes on, which I'll come to in a second. But he said, he said, we we did the Marooned one. I think Marooned's one of my favourite episodes. And he said that Craig had said that, um, oh, great, we've got rid of the B team. <laughs> oh, no. Wow. Okay, so, and, and then he quickly went, oh, Craig was joking, by the way. You know, we don't think of him as the B team. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Lemons was mentioned as one of his favourite episodes. Gosh. He got, he got asked about Colin will be episodes. pleased. Yeah. Um, he mentioned so he, he mentioned they didn't particularly like Stasis Lee, and I think it when talking to him, what I particularly found interesting was that his aversion to like modern technology. I think that he's not he's quite a kind of uh, not literally a nuts and bolts. He likes his machines. He likes his cars, as we all know. He likes his classic cars. He likes his Jag. He does. You know, he likes trains. He likes all that type of thing, um, and that's very much what he's focused on. What I did find fascinating, and um, I'll talk about this in a second as well, is that he mentioned that he's been watching the most recent season of Prison Break. And I was like, I even I haven't been watching the most recent season of Prison Break. So, because uh, there's, well, there's a new it. season of Prison Break. Well, I don't know. I, I don't. I knew there was. There was definitely. I saw at least three seasons, and I know that there was another one that was released at the time when you know when Twenty Four did a new Die Another Day thing. Uh, or, what the like, one with that didn't have Jack Bauer in it that I yeah, didn't watch? That one. I know around that time there was going to be a Prison Break release, so I don't know if it's that one. It Good sounds like there's grief. been another one since. But yes, yeah, so I was surprised by that. Yeah, so I think he's very much like of the world rather than actually things. So Stasis League is quite a concept episode, so it's probably why I can see why he probably didn't like that. Right. Um, but he mentioned Marooned. He mentioned obviously Dimension Jump as some of his favorite episodes, and he went, he can't really say like a main episode, you know, because he says he's just, they all kind of form into one and I think it's better to do it per season. So I thought that was, that was interesting. I mean, obviously the best season 
is series six and the best episode is Gunman of the Apocalypse. He so as much Gunman. as I like Chris Barry, he is kind of wrong. He did mention Gunman. Good. Uh, yeah. He's, and again, you know, we, we they, I, I have no problem with them doing this because they, they, they do it every single week. You know, they've got to go to all these conventions and, and repeat themselves. But he talked about that he wasn't good at riding horses. So he loves he loves Goodman <laughs> as an episode, but as a non horse rider, he struggled. There was a question about um, Rimmer's Richard the Third speech, and he says, uh, and this the guy who asked the question or the person who asked the question said, "How much Shakespeare have you performed yourself, and who is your ideal Shakespearean character?" Right. The general gist was he doesn't like Shakespeare. <laughs> it was like um, he went. Um, I don't really care. Shakespeare has always has always been. I just find it so dull. Uh, and he says they'll never cast me in a Shakespearean play. And he says that when he was a young actor, there was loads. Of, he had a social group, and uh, a lot of the social group, the actors had like um, scrapbooks on what to watch with, um, you know, how, what to do with Shakespeare and stuff. And he was always thinking, when will this be over? So he says, I'm sorry, Shakespeare leaves me cold. Wow. Yeah. I mean. There are a lot of people who think that, but to actually say that as a as an actor in a room full of people, like the, ball, the man's got balls, hasn't he? Yeah. Oh, he kept saying as well. I just, I, I think I might be, um, I think I might be a little bit on edge today. I'm, I'm giving, I'm, 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 I'm a bit moody. <laughs> that kind of aspect, you know. It's like I'm being a bit controversial today. Um, he also <laughs> said about the fact that he doesn't, they didn't want to be doing Red Dwarf in their fifties, and now they're in the sixties and they're doing it. And he was like, but we're still doing it, so I don't know why. Um, and then I asked the question. So my question was, uh, I had two questions. One I had from the Shipwrecked and Comatose crew, because I sent you the message. about. And by um, Shipwrecked and Comatose crew, what you mean is Matt. <laughs> yes, yes. And I basically, I asked my question. So my question was basically, you know, the archetypal characters such as you know, Rimmer, you've got your Britus, you've got David Brent, you've got Alan Partridge. You know, you've got Forty Towers, you know, Faulty uh, and the like. And says, what is it about British comedy that people like those type of characters? You know, the, the fact that they have that e egotistical element that they um, feel that they like to build themselves up on it to be broken down. Like we've talked about Rimmer before, you know, and, and how that is. And I asked him just about that. And, uh, you know, why is it, do you think that we as a British public think about that? So a very podcasty question. You know, that um, is a very podcasty question. Very well done, yes, being thank podcasty. You. Uh, the other question, and I said, and the second question: Has Robert Llewellyn convinced you to go battery yet? Brilliant. And, and uh, yeah, we'll get to that quite answer in a minute. Um, so he, he, he must have known he wasn't going to say yes. Yeah, no, I knew he wasn't going to say yes. Um, so he, he did say about the. It says, well, they're all British losers, aren't they? they effectively, his answer was, they're all British losers. Um, they're always, he thinks there'll always be a place for that. Um, but things yeah. are changing. Um, it's becoming a little bit more of a box tick ticking exercise right now. And he feels that some identity has been starting to get lost along the way with it becoming a little bit more smoother. And, you know, you're not going to get your characters as much, you know, like your own partridges and stuff. Um, but he did say that, you know, faulty. He's a big, loud man. He's a small prick. Um, you see him getting downtrodden all the time. And you they want to rise and rise and rise. And they don't want to be defeated and stuff and how they build themselves up. And uh, it's similar to Rimmer and Brittus. But what he did say with difference with Rimmer and Brittus is that Brittus is quite an educated man who has feels like he's entitled to run the leisure center. He feels like it's all in my head when I was, when he was talking about this, it felt like I've been doing a bit of university study on like that millennials, Gen Z and stuff like that and how people perceive things nowadays. And okay. um, one of the big things in schools at the moment is that over the last like 10, 15 years is they've been told, you know, reach, aim for the skies, go for the, try and be a CEO, you know, try and be the best you can be. But when people come into the workforce, what they're finding is a social clash because they're having to start from the bottom, you know, glass collecting, working in bars and stuff. Yeah. And they really struggle because they think they're entitled to be the duty manager or the manager of the site or the, even the CEO. And there's a bit of a culture war going on there because it's kind of like, what's the best way of describing it? 
that they feel like that they've been told you are capable, you are capable, you are capable. And then they, they, they want to get into a job and then within a month be, I want to be promoted. And it doesn't, and we know from our age, life isn't like that. Oh yes. So, um, so that was interesting because I didn't think of British in that way. And I thought, actually, that is, that is right, isn't it? British is that kind of person. He is that person that's been given a role that he's not mm. capable of doing. Um, and I'm not saying like children of today, kids of today can't do the job. What, but at the same time, is that's more about them developing and thinking they can get a job straight away. And that's not mm. how the world works. Whereas Britus has been thrown into a role and he feels he can do it, but he can't. And, it's, and he's, in, he's, not, he's not capable of doing it. Whereas Rimmer is the opposite. Rimmer's been told time and time again, he's been downtrodden. You are no good. You are no good. You are no good. And he's battling against Fascinating. that. Fascinating. The fact that his two major characters are kind of strangely polar opposite, yet both fundamentally unlikable. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, <laughs> isn't that strange? Isn't that strange? Uh, so I, I did think that was quite a good answer. I was like, oh, actually, I didn't, I, I never yeah, thought of British in that way. And, and he said, like, obviously, you talk about Partridge and you talk about Faulty. He, th he thinks Faulty is, um, Forty Towers is the best 12 episodes of any comedy. Because he was asked later on about what's your favorite British comedy show. And he went, look, I love loads. I, lo I do love loads. I love, you know, anything from the two Ronnies, Faulty Towers, Markham and Wise, to right up to the office, you know, the, the Brit Ricky Gervais office and stuff and how that's cringe television and that's great and stuff. But he, he says, I th he thinks he'd always go back to Faulty as, as a, like the prime classic um, comedy show. So I thought that was good. Um, and uh, yeah, so he talked a little bit about, bit about Rimmer there. Now, in relation to, and it is an interesting discussion to have actually, and I think he, he can come across as a little bit controversial in, in this mindset. But what he basically said about the electric cars thing was, he says, we're being brainwashed into thinking how wonderful they are. He says, as far as he's concerned, what we're going to do with the battery, the batteries are pretty toxic. That... Um, People, the kids are being sent down in Africa into the mines to mine for cobalt and lithium. And, you know, is that going to have an effect o over the course of time? That electric cars are about control. They, they are able to be hacked. You know, I mean, I wouldn't buy, I personally wouldn't buy a BYD car at the moment because it's a Chinese car. So, you know, we only got to look at news today about hacking and things like that from the Chinese establishment. So there's a little bit of like really kind of interesting discussion about, no, he just can't, he says he, the downside of electric cars are that people are being brainwashed into it. We haven't got the infrastructure. What are we going to do with the batteries? There's people being, children are mining for stuff, cobalt, lithium, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought that was, that was quite an interesting um, look at it. I think there's he does, no solution. And I think yeah. he's right to point out the flaws. I do think he's right to point out the flaws, but I, it also suits his argument to find things because he doesn't want to drive an electric car. So the reality is in a modern society, nobody wins and there isn't a, well, actually a way to be ethical. So I, I, I agree with him and disagree with him in equal measure, I think. And I think from the way you said it, he seemed to be pretty reasonable about it rather than ranty and cunty. Yeah, he had his, he had his arguments to come. So he's obviously looked into it and he's had his arguments against it. But what I find yeah. quite interesting is that you, and this is the way we should be doing it, is that Robert is really, will, will really argue his case. If we put Chris Barry and Robert in the same room, that would be a very interesting conversation if we just to go, go. But what I like go. about it is that they are still clearly friends, despite having a significant difference in opinion. Mm. And that is actually possible, you know. I know. You know, I, 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 people get so upset over things. I have right-wing friends, believe it or not. I rag them ragged, but I have right-wing friends. And some of my lefty mates are like, how can you possibly be friends with him? I'm like, because he isn't just one thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so that was that. Was, and he started to then, he, he then started to go maybe a little bit over to the edge where he was saying stuff like, you know, I, I, my 25-year-old Jag couldn't get hacked into. I was like, well, that's a true. That's very true. Yeah. Um, and he says, uh, a 25 year old petrol 3.2 liter with the engine warmed up. Once you stand behind it, you, it's still pretty clean. I mean, it's not perfect, it's pretty clean. It, it, you can't, it that does smell a little bit clean. like, it does smell a little bit like weed, but you, but you can't smell much really? of it either. Really? I thought, mm, is that, 
Is he being a bit facetious? I, I, I did maybe grab a little bit of facetious humor in there, though, with him saying that. There was a little bit of like, you know, don't take the words, listen to the way he's delivering them. I think there was a little bit of like, yeah, I know there's a there's an element to this, but yeah, but it's the fact he's just saying, I'm still pretty clean. I'm standing behind now. I can stand here all day. And, you know, I might get a little bit of weed smell, but that's about it. Really? Uh, so there was that. Yeah. And then, it, then there was other, like, other questions, like you'd hear. It says, what did, what did the crew think about you making impressions of them? And he started to do the impressions of them and how Craig always turns around and goes, do I always sound like that? Do I always sound like I'm not really bothered about stuff and things? So, yeah. So it was, it was a really good 40 minutes um, conversation. Nice. So, yeah. So you really enjoyed it and it was actually worthwhile. I think for me, Comic Cons, that's the best bit is the yeah. Q and A's. I um don't go very often, but that's the stuff that I really look forward to at Comic Con. And I'll be honest, I do like a little looky look around the shops as well. Mm. Yeah, there was plenty there was uh, a guy who was taught who was selling a red dwarf book based on the book of Genesis. There was an author who's had his audio book um done by Chris Barry as well. Um, there, I think his name's Steve something. Might have to put that in the show notes. But um, but yeah, he, he's had a Chris Barry's had has done an audio book for him. Um, and there was obviously you know the cosplay stuff, and uh, there was loads like posters and pin badges, and you know like everything you'd normally get at a comic con, you know mm. that kind of aspect to it. And some magazines were there for for, for a fiver. There was um, Tongue Tide was available on CD for fifteen quid. Um, I used not- to have that, but got blown up in a dead car. Okay, well, I could have bought it for you for fifteen quid, but I didn't. Um, I think I paid like one ninety nine for it from Mike Lloyd's Music in nineteen ninety whatever. <laughs> so that was it, really. And then um, the final thing was just the photo shoot. So that was pretty much the day after that. Uh, the photo shoot was all right. It was just the usual, you know. Just there was quite a long queue for him. We had to wait a bit of time because, like I said at the beginning, after his Q and A, it was basically chock a block for the rest of the day. You couldn't, you mm-hmm. know, you you have to wait in the queue. There was a couple of cosplayers, a couple of people in um, Rimmer outfits. One woman in particular was dressed up as Red Dwarf, which I found funny. Uh, what, she, the, the ship? The ship, yeah. Good. Yeah. So, you know, the, the scoop at the front, that was, yeah. the top of, that was the top of her head. So that her head was popping out of the scoop. Good. And the rest of Red Dwarf as a body. Good. Uh, so it was good. So there was a couple of people like that. Um, there was a couple of uh, Mr. Flibbles around in Gangnam Dresses. What? I was not actually Mr. Flibble. No, the, they, they had a Mr. Mr. Flibble. Flibble. Yeah. Now, now that would be good. Cosplay as Mr. Flibble. I, I might have to try that. I might have to see if I can do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then um, in the in the Q and A, actually, when when he was talking about the electric cars, he talked about a uh, Bugatti Veyron, and you know, it's just a ridiculous car that. Uh, and he was saying about um, how it can go from not to seventy in seven seconds, but it can also like slow down as quick, and there's a barrier. Ah. Uh, that this guy keeps putting up because most cars will go past the barrier. The, the Ver- Veyron never does it. That's so, actually kind of more impressive that it can slow down that fast. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's a it's a wonderful beast, the Veyron. Like, um, and um, I, I, as I got to the queue, I, I went fairly late on, so I think there's maybe about fifteen, twenty people bef- after me, and there was maybe about sixty people ahead of me, maybe a little bit less. But then. It's obviously, as you do with photo shoots, you go in, you get the picture, you go. You're told, just do it. Um, and that happened right the way through. Didn't really hear anything, any of any of issues. I walk. Mm. My, my other half went with her twin sister. And Chris Parry went, oh, because he, he talked to her, obviously, and no, obviously I was connected with her. And he went, oh, there's two of you. Like, because they're both twins. So, so they got a picture with them. And then I went to get my solo picture with him. And he, he kind of like just come to me and said, um, do you have an electric car then? I was like, no. No, I don't have an electric car, Chris. No, no, I'm all right. <laughs> I've got a diesel. I'm all right. <laughs> I've got a diesel. Um, Naughty. I've got a diesel. I've got a diesel. And then I went, but if you get the chance to, if you ever get to go on a, a Bugatti Veyron again, then give me a ring because I do. And you know, I'm just being joking around. Give me a ring yeah. because, um, you know, I would, I'd love to be in that beast. It's just an amazing thing. And then he started to talk to me about that. And then the guys at the photo booth were like, come on now, move on. And I was like, all right, Chris, Brilliant. I think Todd, I've got to go. So I left. And as I walked out, I got a picture next to an eighteen van, and that was me. That was that was the end of the day. You put those pictures on the social media already, haven't you? I put the Chris Barry one on, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that Brilliant. and that was the day. The, the main point was to go and see Chris Barry, to speak to him, to meet him because I, I haven't met anyone from Red Dwarf Crew bar 
Rob Turnbull. Just have that conversation, get a couple of questions for Shipwrecked and, you know, get a picture with him. So job done. Well done. Not a lot of money in my local town or city, if you want to class it as a city, because it's technically a city. So that was me. Technically. Yeah. But you had a nice time and you think it was worth going? Yes. I'd be fascinated to see whether this new film materializes because You've got to take it with a pinch of salt, but also surely at this point he wouldn't say something that was going to get him into trouble. Yeah, it's it, for me. It solidified that they were doing something because we've not really heard from Doug. We've heard from. But I love that they're Rob. definitely doing Rob stuff and Doug stuff, and they're going to get both, which potentially means lots and lots of Red Dwarf shit. Yeah, the other thing actually that he did say in the Q and A. Now thinking about it, there was a question asked about the Rob and Doug thing because Rob. Obviously, he's doing a prequel with Titan. I don't think Chris knows too much about that, to be fair. From the way he was talking, it was very kind of like, uh, Rob's reached out to me, but we haven't really talked about anything. Um, mm. But he did get asked, if there was a, someone in the 20s now that was asked to play Rimmer, who would you cast? And what he did say was that he doesn't really watch much in the way of young, young actors anymore. Mm. He doesn't tend to watch that kind of thing. So it was, difficult, it was difficult for him to kind of pass that. But what he did say is someone who was a li- maybe a little bit older, like as in my and your age, around your 40s, that you could probably potentially put in there. And it was, um, uh, and he struggled with the name, and I'm struggling with the name now. Julian, ah, brilliant. Julian, is it Julian Barrett from Mighty Boosh? Oh, uh, I've never watched the Mighty Boosh. I, okay. I know I've... Um... And well, it's, the sidekick to no, it's a sidekick to Noel Fielding from Mighty Boosh. said he could make a good rumor. But he's, huh. he's about our age. So, right. Yeah. So, so there was that as well. Um, but yeah. So I hope that uh, gives some insight into, into it. But yeah, they, I think the the Doug thing for me is like, we haven't heard much from Doug. And with Chris saying that, he wouldn't say that if they're quite a well down that well. And green light to me means that, there's definitely some sort of script or draft in there and it just needs to look for production stuff now, I think. So we'll see. We'll watch hmm. his space. I'm looking forward to this film if it happens, but I'm trying not to get too excited as well. It's all right. You've got Red Dwarf 11, 12 and Promised Land to do yet, yeah, mate. It's fine. And uh, Titan. And Titan, yeah. It's I'm right. a little bit jealous that you uh, got to do this and maybe I should go to a Comic-Con at some point and see if I can actually have a chat with the folks from Red Dwarf. They've all, from what we've seen, seemed super, super kind to fans and friendly and stuff. And um, while we were talking, I was checking if there was another Dimension Jump coming up. There's no news on that. The last one was uh, a couple of years ago. So we'll probably do one of those. I think it'd be fun if we could all go to that, potentially. Yeah, that'd be or good if, if they do another something one. Something like that. And you'd think Dimension Jump as well, thinking about these two new projects. Hopefully yeah, soon, yeah. You'd think you'd think they'd like want to capitalize on the fact that Red Dwarf might be a little bit more in the ether, and because they're they've got a following, you know, and it's all people oh, around yeah. our age, isn't it? It's all people. I mean, yes, there's newcomers all the time, but you know, you're talking your people in the forties and fifties now, so because obviously they're in their sixties, so we're about ten, fifteen, twenty years behind them. So yeah, so yeah. it'll be good. Well, thank you for joining us for this special extra episode of Shipwrecked and Kermadoes. And until next time, okay, 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 okay. Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast, was created and produced by Mark Adams and Kurt North. You can find us on Twitter at Red Dwarf Pod, and we are part of the We Made This Podcast Network, which can be found online at WeMadeThisPod.com or on Twitter at WeMadeThisPod. Hehehe. <laughs>